2024 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Mr. Edwards or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Mr. Edwards, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum. Thank you. I'll start with Ms. Booker Dwyer. Present. Ms. Frempong. Ms. Harvey. Present. Mr. Young. Mr. McMillian. Present. Three are present. Thank you. A quorum is present. Mr. Edwards, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you. Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Madam. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Here. Ms. Sample. Here. Ms. Crew. Present. Ms. Jamison. Here. Ms. Smith. Okay, uh, Mr. Hartlow. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn the meeting back over to Ms. Booker Dwyer. Thank you. Ms. Barr, please proceed with the FY25 quarter one updates. Thank you and good afternoon. As these reports were posted to board docs last week, I will just provide a brief some brief project status summary as of September 30, 2024. As of uh, September 30, 2024, we had five reports that were issued and presented to the audit committee related to the facilities maintenance, eligibility of psychological services for students under Section 504 and I IDEA, COBRA, criminal background checks, the help desk, and BCPS serve. We had one audit that was still in the reporting phase, and that was the school activity fund accounting audit. Four projects were in the field work stage, and they are the employee and student hearings, which is appeals on employee matters, the um, temporary services, Kelly service payments, schools that were identified on a continuous monitoring result basis, and student support services, pupil personnel, the hom homeless eligibility, and shared domicile. Four projects were in planning. They were the early childhood preschool and pre-K programs and curriculum with respect to the Maryland Blueprint initiatives, school climate and culture with the extended suspension and expulsion, the information security officer, security controls over the on-premise network, and a school activity fund and procurement card audit of Dundalk Middle School. Consequently, we had 13 projects that were not started as of September 30, and they were the College and Career Readiness, Dual Enrollment and Early College Access Programs, Title I and Community Schools, the Community School Expansion Plan, the Customer Service Center, Call Center, Risk Management, Workers' Compensation, Benefits and Retirements, Benefit Enrollment Process, Department of Social and Emotional Support, Bullying, Harassment and Intimidation Prevention Process, Department of Research Accountability and Assessment, Data Warehouse, Employee Training and Development, National Board Certification and Educators Rising Programs, Food and Nutrition, the Food Procurement, Network Support Services. There were two uh, that had not been started, and that was Enterprise Data Backup and Disaster Recovery Services, as well as Network Infrastructure. And the schools and cyclical areas of focus that we would identify based on risk assessment results and Hereford Middle School uh, School Activity Fund Audit and Procurement Card Audit. I'd also like to call to your attention um, 
down towards the end of the report is what we call issue tracking. So we do complete follow ups on all um, findings that we have related to our audits and the status of management management's corrective action. So as of September 30, we had four projects that were completely closed, meaning that uh, management's uh, corrective action was completed or management uh, accepted responsibility for risk until the the um, issue was resolved. So those four projects were the MSDE certification and maintenance, the ESOL new immigrant new immigrant enrollment. Uh, three of, the, of those four issues were closed. One out of four, uh, the leadership had to accept responsibility for risk until resolved. The information technology IT security audit was completely closed and the school safety SRO program, six of the seven issues were closed. One out of the seven leadership accepted responsibility for risk until it can be resolved. We have five follow ups that are scheduled from October 2024 through December 2024. The two in October relate to the student enrollment process in focus, the special education and law office dispute resolution. There are two in November. Um, one is related to COBRA and the other is related to ADA accommodations. And the one in December is the facilities construction and improvement change orders. There's one finding there that we need to follow up on. Um, there were seven areas where corrective action was scheduled to be completed between uh, October 2024 through July 2025. And so consequently, we can't do anything with respect to follow up until uh, the corrective action is completed. So for the month of October, there were uh, two on online e-learning opportunities and school safety measure program. There was one finding there that we need to follow up on December 20. December would be the science and health physical education grade, grade five health curriculum and with transportation, the bus contractor management. January would be the science, health and physical education, science risk mit mitigation and out till July 2025 would be purchasing contracts, agreements and leases. There was one audit that we're just not sure um, when there would be resolution and it has to do with the audit of manual payroll. There is a potential that there may be some resolution with the implementation of the new ERP system. And that concludes my report for the Q1 work plan update. I will now turn it over to Mr. Fletcher for his Q1 uh, update related to investigations. Thank you, Ms. Barr. And here, that report. Let's see. OK, that report should be up now. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bart. Uh, this is a uh, brief summary of our year to date investigative statistics as of the end of the first quarter of FY25. And this report is available on board docs. As of the end of the first quarter, we received a total of 40 cases. And let me slide down. I apologize. Let me slide down here. Uh, table one here summarize those cases, which show that 19 were kept for investigation by internal audit. Table one also shows that of the 19 cases kept for investigation by internal audit, two were a conflict of interest, four were falsification of records, seven were either payroll fraud or overtime abuse, and six use, I'm sorry, six were a misuse of property or BCPS resources. Now, as we move on to table two, here on page three, we note that in addition to the 40 new cases received so far this fiscal year, 15 cases were open at the end of the previous fiscal year, resulting in 55 cases that were either, either are or have been opened throughout FY25. And so far in FY25, 33 of the 55 cases have been closed, resulting in 22 cases uh, that are active as of the end of the first quarter. Now, for our Office of Internal Audit Investigations, which are here in this first column, 35 were open throughout the fiscal year and 15 have been closed, resulting in 20 cases that are still open as of the end of the first quarter. Details for these cases are below in Table 3. And for the management investigations, which are here in our second column, 20 were open throughout the fiscal year and 18 have been closed, 
resulting in two that were still open as of the end of the first quarter. And details for these cases, uh, for these management investigation cases, are below in Table 4. And in addition, as you'll recall, we do include data visualization charts. And so they are on pages seven and eight, and they provide information, additional information related to the types of cases that our office receives. And the charts here on page seven, take a look at the classification of the different types of allegations. And so you'll see that we have uh, for our FY25, so this is for the first quarter of FY25, and then this, this is actually a 36-month analysis. And same thing on page 8, we have uh, a look at our substantiation rates for our internal audit investigations. And again, this is, first one is for the first quarter of FY25, and second one is the rolling 36-month analysis. And Ms. Barr, I turn it back to you and Ms. Booker Dwyer for any questions. Hey, thank you. Uh, uh, committee members, do you have any questions about uh, either of these reports? Ms. Harvey. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just need some help in understanding some of the language uh, that's used in the report. So when we talk about uh, a tentative objective, can someone explain to me uh, what is meant by tentative? Certainly, Ms. Harvey. So <clears throat> when we, when we um, put the plan together, we have to, gather information from some of the process owners. And as a result of that meeting, we we have a more in-depth conversation with them than as um, we do during the risk assessment because we're one-on-one -on -one with the individuals and perhaps more than just one individual who has completed the risk assessment. We gather that additional information and then we have a debriefing discussion um, after that to make sure that the objective that was identified in the original work plan still makes sense to do. And if it doesn't make sense to do, then we revise the objective based on the information gathering or the information obtained at the entrance conference. Um, or sometimes we'll get information that would uh, clue us in that we would have to either defer the project um, to a later time or just not need to do that project at all based on additional information that had come in in between the time that we originally completed the risk assessment and and the time that we're ready to complete the project that's why we use the word tentative okay so just so I, i'm making sure i understand it's tentative because the objective is established and then once you do your uh, risk assessment and entrance conference, it may be uh, determined that that objective is not, for lack of a better word, really the target that you want to to audit. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, yes, that's probably a, a good uh, assessment of that, that um, again, based on the new or additional information received post risk okay. assessment, it makes oh, sense okay. to re revise the objective with this more involved interaction because it's usually with more individuals um, than were involved with the uh, uh, original risk assessment. Okay, and where where does the risk assessment fall in in your process? Because I, I'm I'm looking at I can see clearly that you have stages whether you haven't started yet or you're in field work stage or the reporting stage or the planning stage. Can you give me kind of like the order of process? Is it not started planning, uh, field work and then reporting? Is that the order it goes in or is there an order? Yes, that's it. If that's oh. it. It's it's um, the planning stage comes first and then the field work stage comes second. And then we have a review process and then we have a reporting process. Um, so that's exactly how, how it works, basically. Great. There's great, different great, stages great. In, in the audit process. Within um, those particular 
headings, there's different stages. That is that, correct for, okay. for any project, for any okay. for any audit that we do. We do have different stages as we progress through and some of the information. Keep in mind that this was a, a quarter one report, so all the information provided is as of September 30, but some of these um, projects, you know, we continue to move on and they're in a different stage a different now. Stage. Right, mm -hmm. I, I understand. And so at what stage would you determine whether your objective is, remains tentative or is on target for what you uh, assessed in the beginning or if you need to adjust it based on uh, the information you've gathered? Would it be in the field work stage or the planning stage? Where in this process mo would most that? Tip most typically, it, it is in the planning stage. It is in the planning stage. OK, great. Thank you. That's very he helpful. You're uh, and then so I, I, I see that there's lots of projects that you all are working on or, or are planning to work on. How is the audit uh, department, you and your team determining or prioritizing these particular projects? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of variables that go into that, Ms. Harvey. Um, I I meet monthly with, um, well, I meet monthly with two of the chiefs and quarterly with uh, some of the other chiefs, and I meet monthly with the superintendent. So before we even get started on things, I ask them what makes sense timing-wise with respect to the responsibilities of those individuals in those areas for us to come in. So for example, we have a benefits audit, uh, benefits enrollment audit on the plan. This would not be a good time at all for us to be in because it is open enrollment. So that we take, sense. yeah, we that's, that's a very big piece of how we schedule things out because uh, we don't wanna add to anybody's workload by doing the audit when we know that they're in a very um, crunch time period in their regular jobs. So I, I worked that out with with the chiefs initially okay. and okay. um and the superintendent on occasion, but primarily with the chiefs. So then when we know the time of year that we can do it, then we have then we also then have to identify when our resources are available um, to complete those um, activities and those audits. So that's kind of how we we do it because we have to make sure that the individuals that we're auditing are available and it, it and we're very sensitive uh, to the to their normal workload. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. And then I just have a couple of more uh, follow up questions. Um, mm -hmm. In the outcomes of the quarterly audit, when it says when you say that um trying to find it the the specific language that leadership accepts risk until resolved mm -hmm. what does that mean that means that the corrective action has not been implemented yet and because the corrective action has not been implemented there is still a potential for liability to be cps until that particular finding has been corrected so, for example, um, I'll, I'll just give you an example for for the MOU and the SRO handbook. They were updated to allow for an alternative gang related course, which was called great to be taught instead of dare. But neither course was taught at 12 of the 27 eligible middle schools in FY24. So we asked the Department of School Safety to continue to remind uh, the principals of the important the importance of scheduling officers to teach the middle school students and monitor the schools to make sure that the courses are being taught. And exceptions are supposed to be escalated to executive leadership for resolution, but that wasn't resolved. And until until then, executive leadership would have to accept the risk that all not all sixth grade students received important information regarding drug and gang activity, and they could possibly miss out on critical and positive interactions with law enforcement. So okay. that's what that was for that particular um, matter. OK, and then last mm -hmm. question in the investigative report uh, in. The types of 
I'm trying to find a table. Table number four. Um, it talks about management investigations and it, it has a category for employee behavior. It, it, is that employee behavior that's different from the other categories that are listed in um, table three, like falsification of records or payroll fraud? I, and, yes. And should I? Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. That's quite all you. right. And should I assume that uh, the items in table three are items committed by individual employees, but they're categorized um, differently? I mean, they're ca categorized for the audit investigations and that the items in table four are also individual employee, but they don't meet what you're considering fraud, waste, and abuse. So the employee behavior, for instance, would be something different than that yes and and so i'm, I'm going to kind of answer your 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 question in order um and so actually one of the things that that we're doing as we continue to refine our process is is that moving forward what you'll see here in table four is really going to be management issue in all of those uh in terms of the issue because that's ultimately what they are whether it's um as you see here some say a student issue some say employee behavior uh when you do see employee behavior that is um what we would consider employee conduct uh so it's not necessarily an allegation of fraud waste or abuse um and so that is uh let's say you know uh, something came in through the hotline and said uh a teacher is teaching this subject and shouldn't be teaching uh, or teaching this during the day. And, and, you know, that shouldn't be something that's in our classrooms. Um, sometimes things like that will come through our hotline that that would be what we would consider uh, employee behavior or employee conduct, if you will. Um, now, as opposed to when you're asking before about up here where you see the different categorizations, Yes, these are the ones that we investigate within internal audit um, where there is a specific allegation of fraud, waste, or abuse. Now, yes, sometimes it is an employee. Sometimes it's an external uh, party, whether it be a, a, a company or a uh, vendor or whatever, you know, whatever that external entity may be. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's fraud, waste, an allegation of fraud, waste, or abuse um, being committed against the school system. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for those answers. Of course. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Um, any, any other board members have questions? Okay. No, thank just, you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. So I just have a few questions. So on that work plan report, um, I see that there are several projects that are beyond the planning phase, but the objective is still listed as tentative. So could we have the, the final objective for those that are beyond that planning stage? So for I'm looking at like number one, um, number eight, number 18 is in the reporting stage, but it still has tentative, a tentative objective. So could we get the, um the objectives for these yes we can send you the updated objectives if they were in fact updated good point thank you and then for item 20 um where you have schools identified based on continuous monitoring results could you speak a little bit to how you're identifying schools well we look at all schools right we look at all schools and we have criteria set up. That was a review, a three year um, cash analysis, trend analysis. And we look for anomalies uh, based on certain criteria over certain uh, dollar amount and changes in their cash balances. And so we identified um, 20 schools that had some very uh, high balances or uh, a high balance. Um, of activity that created a big change in from year to year in their cash balances. So we went through and identified the, uh, 
for every school, we did that. And then out, out of looking at every school, we identified 20 that we needed to follow up on just to make sure that there wasn't anything um, out of the ordinary or any type of fraud or any type of um, missing funds, things of that nature. So we're working, we work with the uh, principals and the uh, fiscal assistants or bookkeepers at those schools. And once we finalize the interaction with the principals, we'll be writing a report related to that and bringing it to the committee. Thank you for that. And You're then welcome. I had a couple of questions on the invested and in on the investigative uh, report. So oh. in table three, the uh, item number nine that's found inconclusive. Could you speak a little bit to that um, yes. uh, regarding the paper fraud? Yes, thank you. Sure, absolutely. And and so what I'm going to do is kind of talk through all the different uh, levels of su of substantiation. Um, just just to kind of get it all out there, and so you can tell the the difference of of how we're able to indicate which one it would be. Um, so with anything that's substantiated. Uh, that means we have we have ironclad proof that something that was alleged truly did happen. And then our report will will go into the details of that and we'll provide the level of of support to to evidence that uh, that this event did happen. This allegation did occur. Uh, ultimately, what what we go back to is sometimes our reports are used for. Um, uh, Corrective action, uh, not corrective action, I apologize. It's my audit brain speaking. I have to go back to my investigator brain. Is used for disciplinary action. Uh, sometimes it's used for legal action. So we have to be comfortable sitting in um, a, a either a courtroom supporting this, or we have to be comfortable sitting in a, a room where this is being appealed. Uh, if if something, you know, if, if the employee receives some type of of uh, disciplinary action and they appeal that. So we have to be very comfortable with that substantiation. Um, unsubstantiated is the exact opposite. If, if we're able to unsubstantiate something, we have evidence documentation that shows that whatever that allegation is did not happen. Um, there, you know, there's no, it either did or it didn't. With unsubstantiated, we're able to show that it did not occur that a policy was not violated, law was not violated. Inconclusive, which is where, where your, your question was, that is that gray area. Uh, so keep in mind when we write these reports and, and do our investigations, it is not our opinion. It is not our uh, guess. So it's, it's we're either able to factually and evidentiary, evidentiary support it or we are not. Um, and so when we do have that inconclusive, that means that we are in that gray area. However, what we do is, even though we're we're not substantiating or unsubstantiating, we're still providing everything that we were able to collect, still documenting and providing that information in the report, uh, whether it's interviews, individuals we spoke with, um, documentation that we collected, reviewed, any type of analysis we did, that documentation will still be in there. Uh, but if if we're not comfortable sitting in a courtroom saying yes this happened or no this did not happen, that's when it's going to fall into that inconclusive. And so it doesn't. And so Baltimore County, so we would we're just not going to know whether or not payroll fraud was committed or not. Does it stay in this gray area, or is it recommended to an external evaluator? No. So or, like, and, what's and the next step for that? Sure. And and so this is with all of our investigations, whether it's substantiated or not. Uh, it, it goes to four individuals. It goes to the superintendent, goes to our general counsel, it goes to our chief human resource officer, and then Ms. Barr is, is our fourth recipient. Those four individuals, when, when they receive all of our investigation reports, then make would make that decision, okay, this needs to be the next step. Uh, typically, we, and, and Ms. Barr, you'll have to help me with the name of the, uh, it's a disposition. Uh, we receive a disposition back from uh, human resources to say internal audit has found this um, and it'll, you know, we cite whatever law policy or rule has been violated. Uh, so their disposition would say internal audit has found this. We, we being them, um, 
are, are making the following recommendations for whatever those next steps would be. Now, in the case of inconclusive, yes, that would be something that they may make a decision to go one way or the other, but it would, again, it, we provide all the information out there, all the evidence that was um, collected and, and um, interviews that were documented. Okay, and then Does, for 13, 14, and 15, where it says no report, and I, I know that there, there's no reports. There was, uh, I think, about three reasons why there could be no reports. Mm -hmm. Could we know why? So instead of saying no report, could we, is, could we know why there was no report? Like which of the three or four categories that you listed? Um, let me see where it says that either the reporter didn't provide enough information to investigate, additional information was requested and did no response was received or mm -hmm. it's already being investigated by an external group. Um, so in these reports, could we know that um, like which which of the three um, just a little bit more information around the no report? Um, we could. I think we could provide that. I, right, because I, I just get back to like the payroll fraud, right? Because we know that's mm -hmm. serious. And so mm -hmm. is if it's being investigated by someone else. Like I just wouldn't want to have that out sure. there. It was not enough sure. information. Yep. Um, same thing with misuse of company property or resources. When it says no report, is it because someone else is looking into it? Or it, so it would just be helpful to have um, Absolutely. that unpacked a little bit more. And and to be perfectly honest, since this is a um a, a public facing document probably wouldn't put that on here, but if we were to have the conversation in each of our meetings, I could certainly at this point, I'll have that information ready for recall. Thank you. Of course. Okay, those are all of my questions. Sure. And and actually, um, if I could, Miss Harvey, I when you were asking earlier about the I wanted to skip back down to table four about the management issue. Um, uh, cases that we receive. The the one part that I did not add is so with all of these that we do receive, once we've triaged the the um, allegation information, if it does fall into this category, we send this to the superintendent's office. And um, uh, to be perfectly honest, Miss Stifler is fantastic in receiving that information and getting it allocated. Or I'm sorry, getting it uh, um, assigned out to the appropriate individuals for their uh, review and disposition. And she gets that response back to us very quickly uh, to say, you know, this is what we've done so far um, and, and to inform us that they have uh, begun addressing this matter or begun addressing the the allegation. So I forgot to mention that earlier when we were when you had thank asked you. that. Um, thank you for that clarification. Madam Chair, I just have one other. This conversation actually made me uh, think of another question I have, if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and it's just that when you're doing your investigations, do you have a standard time frame in which they are to be completed? Like, are they to be completed like 30 days, 60 days? Uh, what does that look like? No, and that's that's uh, uh, a fantastic question. And so just very similar with audits, it's kind of based upon resources and what the specific allegation is. Um, obviously, there are things that would trigger to, to um, have that become a higher priority, higher precedent uh, project for someone to work on. For example, if we receive information and uh, if we receive an allegation and an employee is on leave, um, uh, like an administrative leave, then yes, that would, uh, we would accelerate that. Last thing we want is, is to have someone sitting not doing their their B, typical BCPS job when there's um, uh, you know we don't want to be a cog in that machine. So we do those investigations. Um, we we accelerate the priority on those if that makes sense. Thank you. Of course. Hey, the next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, November twelfth, twenty twenty four, at four thirty p.m. Excuse me, yep. uh, Ms. Booker Dwyer. We had one more um, update to provide with oh, respect sorry, to the go ahead. risk. Sorry. Um, I, I just wanted to <clears throat> uh, make the committee aware that the timeline that we provided to you, all September tasks were completed in accordance with our timeline, including the research of various external entities, Red Book and IIA information. 
with respect to staff development, four individuals completed the certified risk-based internal auditor program, and all four individuals sat for and earned the certified risk-based internal auditor designation. And we completed questions for the survey, surveys for the superintendent and board members, and it is in a survey format. Um, these questions were suggested as part of the certified risk-based internal auditor training. However, we had to customize them a little bit for a K through 12 education system. And I shared the superintendent questions with Dr. Rogers at my October 15th meeting with her. And just very briefly, I'd ask Ms. Manna to display the board member survey questions so that you can see what we're proposing for all board members. So we have our background that basically says uh, uh, in policy 8400 that we're supposed to do a work plan. Uh, including input of, of executive leadership in the board. We define what risk and risk, risk, risk assessment and risk are. And then we go into the questions regarding some board operations um, with respect to uh, risk preventing uh, the board from achieving their goals, the strategies in place. And if we skip um, to number four, you can see that these are some of the primary challenges and risks faced by a K through 12 education system. So again, we're just asking or would be asking board members to evaluate the severity of these risks in their opinion for BCPS. And then if there was anything more to add to elaborate on the responses to question number four. Um, and then uh, number six is kind of more open because if if we didn't hit anything that might be in some on somebody's mind, they can enter their answer there. Then just a, a question to talk about how often um, these risks and mitigation efforts are discussed between board members and the superintendent. And then opinions about managing top risks and uh, our ability to respond to extreme events, uh, how you see your, your role as um, providing input to risk management, just just questions like uh, like I said that were suggested by the certified risk based internal audit or designation and then customized for K through 12 education. And I think all together, how many questions are there? 15 questions, and I think 15 is is the catch all that allows you to provide any any feedback and 14. 14 also because um, we're asking, are there any specific areas of focus that you think we should consider for our, for our FY26 work plan? I know in previous meetings, for example, um, Ms. Frempong has has brought up the ERP system. And, you know, we've had some conversations about some other areas of concern of board members. So that would be the opportunity there in question number 14 to really elaborate on the areas that that um, board members think we should consider for our FY26 work plan. So I just wanted to very briefly um, show the committee that that this is done and we are prepared to um, send the survey to board members um, and follow up with interview if that is necessary. Thank you. And so thank you, Ms. Barr. So um, I know this was not an agenda item to, to go over this survey. And just Correct. a brief glance of these questions, this requires a lot more discussion. Um, yes. And so we can place this on a, another agenda item where we can have a more robust discussion around uh, this survey and these questions. Um, and so, uh, so we will not address it now. Uh, we Correct. will move it to another, um, another meeting where we can go through these questions. Because I have a lot of questions about these questions. So I want to make sure that the audit committee members um, will have the opportunity to really look over them and um, and to to come prepared with any questions that they may have. Sure. My main purpose was just to demonstrate that we did everything that we said we were going to do in, in September. It was not meant that we go line by line by line this this evening. OK. Thank you, though. Yes. So the next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, November 12, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. I will now entertain a motion to convene an administrative function session to discuss an investigation conducted by the Office of Internal Audit. So moved, Harvey. Thank you, is there a second? I'll second McMillian. 
Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Three in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. So, uh, committee members, we will join the new Teams link, and um, this part of the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.